everyone see that okay? Awesome. All right. So welcome to uh, Pittsfield Green Drinks. This event is sponsored by Berkshire Environmental Action Team, also known as BEAT. I'm Chelsea Simmons, BEAT's Education and Outreach Coordinator. Um, so I'm going to go over Zoom just real quick. Um, you can mute and unmute yourself as well as turn your video on and off uh, with the microphone and camcorder icons at the bottom left of the screen. Uh, we also have a chat you can use to send questions or comments. Um, this is especially great for when Elizabeth is speaking. Um, you can send them in there and then uh, I can relay those mess or messages, I guess, the questions to Elizabeth. Um, and then there's also a reactions button. Uh, if you click that, there's also uh, a button for a raise hand. So you could do that to indicate that you have a question. Um, but we'll also have a period after the presentation for questions and just discussion. So there'll be plenty of time for asking questions as well. Um, so BEAT is um, a 501c3 nonprofit. You can find out more about us at thebeatnews.org. Um, our mission is to work together to protect the environment for wildlife in support of the natural world that sustains us all. Um, you can also find uh, out what's going on environmentally in Western Mass through our uh, website. So we have a community calendar, which is where we post community events that's sent in to us by other environmental organizations. We also have a jobs board where we um, post just job openings that people send to us as well in the area and regionally. And then we have public notices, um, which are just some of the uh, public meetings uh, and projects that are going around, going on um, in the area. And then the environmental monitor um, is where we post like big projects that everyone kind of needs to know about and pay attention to. And you can also find all of this um, and uh, in our weekly e-newsletter, which you can subscribe to in on this page uh, by going to current weekly newsletter. So because B is a 501c3 nonprofit, all of our funding comes from grants and generous donations, um, which is why we have a donate button here on our website um, to make it easier for folks to donate to beat. So programs like this one, um, Green Drinks, uh, is only possible because of the people who support us. So next month, uh, Zach Adams will be speaking for our Pittsfield Green Drinks on March 15th at 6 p.m. He is a teacher naturalist for Mass Audubon in the Berkshires. And he'll be talking about how to mindfully and respectfully uh, experience nature and how you can deepen that experience, as well as all the work that goes into um, just making wildlife sanctuaries an amazing place for people and the ecosystem. So please consider joining us for that. You can find more info on that event on our community calendar and uh, you can also RSVP through that. But all of that aside, we're here tonight to hear Elizabeth Saunders. So I'm going to hand it off to her and stop sharing my screen. All right. It's yours, Elizabeth. Thanks for being Great. here. Well, thank you so much, Chelsea. It's really wonderful to be here. Uh, for those of you I have not met, which is most of you, I am looking forward to the conversation. My, uh, obviously, my name is Elizabeth Saunders. I'm the Massachusetts Director for Clean Water Action. So just to tell you a little bit about myself and the organization before we dive in, uh, Clean Water Action was founded in the 70s around the passage of the Clean Water Act. In fact, it was founded in 1972. So this is our 50th anniversary this year. And uh, we, but, and we work at the area 
in the areas of the environmental field where environment and public health and justice intersect, which I think is very similar to many of the things that, so we've collaborated with BEAT on many issues uh, over the years that where, where those things intersect. Um, so uh, we, I'm really excited to be here. I've been actually with Clean Water Action for 21 years and I've worked a lot on, I've worked mostly on the issue actually of toxic chemicals and consumer products. That is very connected to waste and trash because all those computer consumer products eventually at the end of their lives end up in the trash. So um, that sort of is what, 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 what it all comes together and it all connects to water pollution as well. So uh, with that, I am actually gonna invite uh, Jane to talk a little bit about the local situation around waste and trash before I dive into the presentation on Zero waste. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, it seems really, really timely to have you here. We just found out a couple of days ago that our local trash incinerator is looking like they're going to be bought by a company that will make them into a transfer station instead. Um, we've known for a while that they were having problems staying in compliance and polluting our air. So we're really interested to see how we can reduce our waste locally and uh, have as little material to transfer as possible. So really excited to have you here. Thank you so much. Great. All right. Um, so I'm going to take a second just to get the screen share going here. And then we'll dive in. So um, this presentation is how mass talk, to talk about zero waste and how Massachusetts can kick its dirty incinerator habit. Uh, so I want to give a shout out to Clean Water Action's intern NG Farm, who is here today, who put these slides together and made them so beautiful. So thank you, NG, for that. Uh, so. Uh, actually, I should just confirm. Can everybody see okay? Is there anything blocking the screen? We're good? Okay, great. Always good to check. Um, oh, and also, if anyone has questions while I'm speaking, feel free to put up your hand or throw something in the chat and Chelsea, and I'm happy to answer questions in between or afterwards or both. So we'll just, we'll just have, a, we get to have a casual conversation here, PowerPoint or no. <laughs> so, um, so this is a quote, uh, I, I don't know if any of you have seen the, the short animated film, uh, Story of Stuff, uh, but this is a quote that was created by Annie Leonard. Uh, there's, I highly recommend the Story of Stuff series. If you haven't checked it out before, they're available online. But a quote from the Story of Stuff is that 99% of the stuff we harvest, mine, process, transport, and run through the system is trashed within six months. That is an astounding statistic. Uh, and another very, another statistic just to kind of start us off. My advanced screen will work. Let's see. Okay. There it goes. Uh, that the United States is just over 4% of the world's population, yet we produce more than 30% of the planet's total waste. And this is, comes from uh, a report by US PERG, Toxics Action Center, which is now called Community Action Works and the Frontier Group. So we have a big waste problem in the US and in the world. Uh, we have a disposable economy that is made up of dis uh, the, the idea the, that everything should just be disposable and replaceable. And, and we have a high, very high consumption rate here in the United States in particular. So we are, we are producing more than our fair share, which probably does not come as a surprise to too many of you, but it's worth just noting and kind of getting our minds around the, the, the extremeness, the, how extreme this is. Uh, right, my slide advancing, there we go. That seems to be the way to do it. So 
incinerators. Let's start there. Y'all have an incinerator in your community. You're quite familiar with the, the problems from the incinerators, I presume. Uh, but to name some of them, incinerators re release a lot of pollutants out of their smokestack. Dioxin, which is uh, formed from the burning of certain types of plastics, and like uh, vinyl in particular, and it is a carcinogen and it uh, you know, has contaminated our meat and milk supply because of the dioxin precipitating into the environment from manufacturing and from incineration, precipitating out of the, out of the sky. Uh, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, mercury, lead, sulfur dioxides. There's a lot of significant, you know, significant air pollutants, carcinogens, heavy metals that are emitted from the smokestacks of incinerators. Per, per unit of energy, they produce more toxic pollution than coal-fired power plants. So you often will hear the term a waste to energy incinerator. They'll be billed as renewable energy sometimes. In fact, I think they may be currently in the uh, in the state's renewable portfolio standard, uh, which is the, uh, there's a, there's, the state has a definition of what can be counted as renewable energy and incineration is unfortunately in that. And a good, and that is a real problem because of the huge amount of, of pollutants that incinerators emit. So they also produce toxic ash, which, you know, when you burn the trash, just like if you burn a fire, you know, if you burn wood in your fireplace, uh, it doesn't just completely disappear. There is something left. There is ash left. And like that in an incinerator, there is ash left. It is very toxic because of what went into the incinerator. And that has to be stored. Uh, something has to be done with that. So it has to go into a landfill. So the incinerators also do not completely disperse all of the, uh, all of the material. Then of course, another option of how we get rid of our trash are landfills. And landfills are also a major problem. I, uh, they emit methane, which is an extremely potent greenhouse gas. Uh, they leach toxic chemicals, including PFAS, uh, which is the chemical that's used in Teflon pans. It's used to make uh, food packaging, like paper food packaging in particular, non-stick or, or water resistant, grease resistant is to keep the food from soaking through the paper packaging. They're used in clothing, uh, like waterproof clothing, coating on umbrellas. They're in tons and tons of carpeting, furniture, anything that's non-stick, all of that has PFAS in it, which is, a, uh, and, and PFAS don't break down in the environment. They're not burned up in incinerators. They don't break down in landfills. They don't break down. Uh, and they've contaminated our water supply, uh, partly because of leaking from landfills. Heavy metals leach out of landfills, volatile organic compounds, which are air quality problems, uh, PCBs, which y'all are extremely familiar with living on the Housatonic River. Uh, and radioactive materials. So all kinds of uh, things are leaching out of landfills. And really there's a lot of water supplies in the state that have been contaminated by the landfills that are in the communities. They, really, they often leak. There are a lot, especially older landfills tend to be unlined. And this can be true of the ash landfills, the landfills that uh, hold ash from incinerators or municipal waste landfills. Uh, so I think it's, it's when in doubt, if you have a landfill, it's a best, the best assumption is that it is probably leaking because they really all do eventually, if not from the get-go. So they're a real pollution problem as well. So, you know, incinerators and landfills are also uh, often, most often located in environmental justice communities. So what this map is showing is the, green, the, the colorful sections of the map are communities that have been designated by the, the state to be environmental justice communities. If they are green, it's because they are designated that way based on the income of residents. Uh, if they are yellow, it's because of those are minority populations in those communities. Uh, the other 
let's say bigger, the darker green is a combination. It's both uh, because of minority and, uh, populations and income level. You can see the other uh, keys, pieces on the map key there, but this is the, the big, those are the major, the major categories in terms of lots of communities. And so these dots, uh, the red dots are incinerators and the black dots are landfills. And as you can see, just about every single one of them is either smack in the middle of environmental justice community or just, uh, but or in the same town, but maybe in a slightly different part of town than the environment, than an environmental justice population. So this is 2020 data, this map and, oh no, it's actually not. I take it back. This is that map is not was not updated. This map is from pre before the last census, um, but honestly, the popular the, the, it will look very similar if we did this <laughs> if we redid this map with the 2020 data. So uh, you get you get the picture. Whoops, we went backwards. Let's try again here. All right, and now we've stopped presenting. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> technical difficulties. It wouldn't be a Zoom meeting without some technical difficulties. All right, here we go. Landfills and UJ communities. So part of the other, another piece of the problem, and I'm gonna get to solutions and better news soon, just to, <laughs> but we, we really, I wanna flesh out the problem here is that our, our recycling is trash. Uh, and our recycling system is very broken right now. So the, in particular, single stream recycling has caused some massive problems. So the single stream recycling, uh, actually don't know, do you all have single stream recycling in Pittsfield or I realize not here, everybody here may live in Pittsfield, but- or is No, it we're almost, dual stream. It goes to the stream. Murph in Springfield. Well, that's a that's a that's a positive thing. Uh, a lot of communities are doing single stream at this point, where the paper and the glass and the plastic and the metal are all getting mixed in together, and that causes a lot of contamination. So you end up with wet paper that is not really recyclable, or ends up with some sort of food scrap on it, or you end up with broken glass mixed in with the paper, or any number of other ways that the the system is not able to sort the recycling back out into its original materials. So our single stream recycling leads to, um, you know, the second picture here is a stockpile of rejected quote unquote recyclables. So you may have heard the news a few years, in the news a few years ago, there was a significant conversation about, we used to ship the majority of our, our quote recyclables from the United States to China and to be processed and recycled there. And a couple of years ago, China said, we're not taking your stuff anymore because it's such terrible quality that we're just having to throw most of it out anyway. It's not actually recyclable. And that draw a lot of attention to the issue. To be honest, people that were already kind of super involved in waste and trash issues we're like, yeah, we knew that already and glad that more people know that now that our, our, that our recycling is just trash. So a lot of our recyclables are now being, are, have been rejected, our, our quote unquote recyclables that are not really recyclable because they're contaminated have been rejected and are being stockpiled or just incinerated or landfilled. And so that's not to say that we should all stop recycling, but it is to say that we need to take a systemic look at our recycling and talk about how it is going to be, how we're going to address this. Uh, so, you know, there's also been situations in the last few years with, uh, you know, barges that were shipping the recycling to China or other countries being rejected. So it wasn't just don't, send, don't start any more barges coming our way, there were some was like, nope, we're not taking any more starting now. And so then you've got this barge floating in the Pacific or wherever uh, full of recyclables. So our recycling system is broken. Single stream is a problem <laughs> as sort of the take home there. All right, so let's start talking about solutions. That was enough bad news for one night. Uh, so zero waste. The way we're going is the, the direction we need to point ourselves is the direction of zero waste. And what does zero waste actually mean? 
It means creating the infrastructure and the habits that make it regular practice to do everything but throw stuff in the trash. So zero waste is not just about you and your household uh, just having to never throw anything away again. And how the heck would you do that anyway? Uh, but it's about thinking at a community level. Uh, how, do we, how do we reduce? How do we reuse? How do we recycle? So those three we're very familiar with, the reduce, reuse, recycle. But also, how do we redesign, reimagine, and compost? Uh, so it's really about thinking about what are all the things that we could be doing with materials uh, besides throwing them in the trash. So I think that zero waste, I find it extremely hopeful. It's one, waste and trash is actually one of the environmental problems that we know how to solve. It's, you know, all the toxic chemicals in our consumer products, there's a lot we know about what to do about that, but there's a lot we don't know. When it comes to climate change, there's a lot that we know how to do, but it's huge. And there's a lot we don't know how to handle yet. When it comes to waste, we actually know what to do. It's just about political will at this point, which of course is you know, not no small thing. So Boston has already created a zero waste plan. It did that um, in 2019 with the, the urging of, for about a decade of Clean Water Action, a number of other organizations in the Boston area. So it had it's a good plan. It needs implementation. Uh, so and it sort of you know got launched right before the pandemic hit, and so that put you know a pause on just about everything everywhere. So uh, still working on that. Uh, and there are many other cities that have done this as well. So Austin, Texas, Los Angeles, San Francisco. I'm not, I don't have recent statistics, but five years ago, maybe we used to say that San Francisco was keeping 80% of its waste out of the trash. And I'm not sure if that included commercial or not. There was, we were saying that Boston had 20 to 30% of its trash was being diverted, going to reuse or compost or something else. And like 80% of San Francisco's was, and it was comparing apples to oranges because they counted it in different ways, but it gives you a picture anyway, that this is possible. Um, so who, wait, who makes zero waste happen? What, what makes this possible? So all businesses have a, a lot, everybody has a role to play. Lots of people have a roles to play. Uh, all businesses have a role to play in, in gate by engaging their employees, their customers, their supply chains. So they can, you know, businesses can make those that are particularly manufacturing or selling uh, products can say, we want to have reusable, we want to sell products that are reusable. We want to sell products that have less packaging um, or that any packaging that does exist is 100% recyclable. Uh, or compostable for that matter. Supply chains, uh, so they can push their supply chains. So even if they are not creating everything themselves, uh, can develop port corporate partnerships and you know, in industrial processes. So all businesses have a role to play. Then there's a particular role and opportunity for businesses to develop and grow in the zero waste economy. Uh, so opportunities for local economic development, small businesses in reuse and in composting and things like that. So I'm going to keep referring to the zero waste plan in Boston because I think it's a model of what can be done everywhere. Uh, one of the things that we were pushing for in the development of that is that it be not just about bringing in more companies, big big waste companies like Casella or Wheelabrator to be um, dealing with the waste, but instead to have some opportunity for, uh, for small businesses in the community, community-based businesses to develop. And that, that as the city was thinking about moving in that direction, how can it encourage that local zero waste economy to grow as an economic opportunity? Municipalities have a really important role to play. Uh, as I mentioned already, the possibility of zero waste plans, municipalities can do single use bans. And uh, so actually, here's a question is, are there uh, already single bans on single use plastics or other materials in, uh, in Pittsfield or in neighboring towns? I, I suspect that there are some. There is in Dalton, there's a single use ban in Dalton for plastic bags. 
great. That's I great. Think many of the towns ban single use plastic bags. Um, many ban styrofoam. And I think it's just Great Barrington that bans small plastic drinking water. Great. Anyone else know of any other others to add to that? So those are, those all contribute. To, those are all part of zero waste plans. Uh, and city municipalities have a really government at large, uh, including municipalities, has a really important role to play in creating the infrastructure to make it possible for residents to achieve zero waste through that's you know whether that's curbside compost collection or uh, recycling that is actually workable uh, as opposed to you know resulting in usable recyclables instead of contaminated recyclables um, whether that is supporting uh, this piece about supporting local economic local businesses to develop uh, repair shops all this th there's lots of infrastructure that helps makes it help, we need going back to the original slide about zero waste setting up the infrastructure and the habits that make it regular practice to do everything but throw stuff in the trash. So municipalities have a huge role to play in developing, helping people develop and helping the community at large develop that regular practice. At the state level, again, we can have zero waste plans. Uh, we can have single use bans at a state level. We can also have producer responsibility laws, which make manufacturers responsible for funding the disposal of, of their products and can incentivize uh, them to you know, include incentives so that they have to pay less if they make it recyclable or if they make it non-toxic. Uh, again, state can create some of that infrastructure and support municipalities and businesses in developing the zero waste economy. And of course, households have a very important role to play. It does take everybody, but also one of the messages when I talk about the issue of toxic chemicals and consumer products is I give people some tips for what to do at home, but I also say, you can't actually shop your way out of this problem. What we need is system-wide, community-wide solutions that make it possible. So again, households have a role to play in fully participating in those systems that are created uh, and, and taking advantage of the opportunities. Um, but for the real impact, and, and certainly a household can, without all that infrastructure, take on a, I've, I've heard of people doing zero waste challenges where they um, you know, will see how low they can get their trash in their house. And that can be a really fun opportunity and a great thing to do. But for real impact, it needs to be community-wide. So we always kind of try to balance those messages about what you can do at home with the message that we really need a system-wide approach. So let's talk a little bit more about the state level. Massachusetts has a mandate to create a solid waste master plan every 10 years. So they've just last fall released the 2030 master plan and the headline is too little too late. So what we and Clean Water Action and uh, other organizations, MassPerg, Toxic, uh, sorry, Community Action Works and um, Conservation Law Foundation, as well with some input and, and collaboration from local groups, including uh, some of you from, um, from BEAT uh, have helped us to advocate for a strong zero waste or for a, well, we were trying to make it a zero waste master plan and they did not, they did not take us up on that name, although they did. And, uh, and they honestly did not totally take us up on that content, but they did uh, move some things in you know, they did sort of set that intention out there, but on a too slow timeline. So basically what we were really pushing for and saying what was needed in the plan is a phase out of incineration. We need to be done with incinerators. It is great news that the incinerator in uh, Pittsfield is on its way out and we need to phase it all the way out. Now, how do you fully phase out incinerate? People will ask, how do you phase out incineration without just meaning you have to build more landfills? Well, let's go back to zero waste. Zero waste can reduce our, our trash by 90%. And then we're going to need very, very little capacity. Uh, we can, uh, so we needed to phase out incineration. What the plan actually did was, ena was enabled 350,000 tons more capacity to be built. So that doesn't mean that necessarily will be built 
but it said it could be built. So that is not the direction we were looking to go. Uh, what's also needed is composting all food and yard waste. This is a no brainer. You can take food and yard waste and with the proper disposal you can and treatment, you can turn it back into dirt. Uh, there's nothing more basic than that. And it can be done through, you know, sort of traditional compost piles or backyard food bins or backyard, you know, kitchen food bins, backyard piles, depending on the property and the, you know, anyone can compost in their home. It can also be done in a community scale in anaerobic digesters, uh, which can, which is a, another a sort of a higher tech way of composting. Uh, so food composting, there was already a ban in the state on uh, disposal of food waste for businesses that produce more than a ton, one ton per week. And that was reduced in this plan to half a ton per week, but it's a far cry from all food and yard waste. So we need that for everybody across the board. Uh, so there is a, so what else is needed is enforcing all waste bans. There's a whole number of materials, which we'll talk about in a second, that are banned from disposal, including that uh, large, those large quantities of food compost. And, and, and so, but these waste bans are not well enforced. And so there needed to be a plan to really actually fully enforce these waste bans. And what the DEP did was they added textiles and mattresses uh, to the ban, but they did not make any plans to improve enforcement. Uh, so the last thing I'll say is that there's 70% reduction by 2030 uh, is what we were calling for. And this calls for 30% reduction by 2030. Now, 70% to get there, just doing the two bullets before that, composting all food and yard waste and enforcing all waistbands would get you to 70%. So that was not a pie in the sky. Um, so the waistbands, uh, we don't need to spend a ton of time with this list, but just so you get to see it, it's a mix of everything from uh, toxic materials like asphalt and cathode ray tubes to uh, just things that we know are recyclable, like glass and medical metal, sorry, glass and metal containers, paper, cardboard, paperboard. So, you know, uh, what else? White goods, large appliances, like sort of just common sense that shouldn't go into an incinerator or a landfill, but should be taken care of. So, some of this does need to go into hazardous waste storage, um, and some of it is needs to be in, um, and some of it would need to be in, um, it, you know, in recyclable or composting, but there's a wide variety of items that are banned uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, whoops, I skipped slide. So the next step for our work is, in for, is pushing the DEP to, so Clean Water, is, I mentioned the groups that were pushing for the uh, zero waste master plan for the state. Uh, that is, we've kind of come together under the banner of zero waste Massachusetts. And the next step for zero waste Massachusetts is enforcing the waste bans. So ban means zero. Uh, and that's the only way we're gonna get to stop having polluting incinerators and landfills in our communities is to enforce these things that we've said we don't need to threat sent to the trash, we shouldn't be sending to the trash. So we're just getting going with this campaign. We're just getting it launched, we're just forming it. But I'm gonna ask you if you would like to and sign up to, to be on deck, to take action when we're ready to have people call the legislature, call the, call the uh, governor to really in, get these waistbands enforced and get the DEP the resources it needs to do that and get the, get the DEP to take take that action. So if you can take out your um, phone as Jane is doing right now, and you can either use that QR code to take a picture to sign up, or you can use that short link. Um, actually, NG, do you mind doing me a favor and uh, throwing that in the chat so we don't lose it as soon as the slide goes past? Um, and so we, but we will give, give a shout out. Uh, we'll be calling on you, on folks to, to engage in this campaign as soon as we get past the planning stage. Uh, so we'd love to have all of you participate. I see that um, a hand has been raised. I just have one more slide. So I think I'm just gonna finish that up and then 
um, and then it will take your question. So just, I did say that there are things that individuals can do while we're still working on setting up this system-wide systems. There are local, there are lots of buy nothing groups around the state. Uh, so that's a, you know, face, often a Facebook group. So ways that people just are sharing things back and forth. That's what, part of what we call the reuse economy uh, as our Craigslist and free cycle. You may have thought of those as a place just to save money, but you're actually participating in the reuse economy and contributing to a zero waste economy by using Craigslist and free cycle. Uh, repair things instead of replacing them. Notice and notice what the, the things that you are throwing in the trash, packaging, uh, other things that are sort of single use and see if there's ones that you can reconsider and, and eliminate from your, from your household. You could take a household zero waste challenge. You could organize a neighborhood zero waste challenge. Uh, so there are certainly resources online for, and tips for doing that and, you know, sort of measuring your, your, your waste and reducing it and learning what can and can't go in the recycling bin. There's a term we call wishful thinking recycling. This is what part of what contributes to the, to the recycling uh, problems is that people throw things in the recycling that are not recyclable at all. So learning the local rules are, is important. Uh, compost your food and learn where your trash goes and talk to people about it because just getting raising awareness is always a contributor. So thank you very much. Uh, these are, I'd be happy to hear from anybody. I'm gonna take questions now, but also hope you'll uh, you know, connect with Clean Water Action uh, through any of the ways here on this slide. Um, so I will stop sharing now for a second. And I think David has a question. I have got a quick question. Um, Great. Well, I th there, there's a lot of notions, you know, the state is gonna do this and the state is gonna I think we've cut out, we cut out. David, are you? David, sorry, you cut out for a second. Can you, can you say that again? The state's gonna do what? You know, we're not hearing you. So I wonder if you could put your question in the chat or we'll come back to you in a second. Are there any other questions? Or Chelsea, have there been questions in the chat that I haven't People caught? just started putting quite a few questions in the chat. Do you want me to read those to you? Yeah, if you could, that would be great. Right, so the first one was, can seeds of invasive species be composted? Oh, that is such a good question. Um, I'm gonna ask if anyone else here has information, has a, any expertise in that because invasive species are not my area of expertise, but I think it's an excellent question. I know. <laughs> Maria, was that Maria who said that? I did, Maria Bartlett. Um, Go ahead. I'm a gardener. Uh, seeds of invasive plants or weeds should not be put into your home composting because it does not get hot enough to kill them. If you have access to a commercial composting system that does get hot enough, yes. But just at home, what I do with any invasive plants that have gone to flower or seed is I, unfortunately, but I put them in my trash and it goes to the incinerator. All right. Thank you for that. Um, and did Sorry, you have another question too? Now? Can I finish oh. my question, please? Uh, sure. Sorry. Sorry, we weren't able to hear you for a minute, but happy to go back to you, David. Go ahead. I, I, is, it, is there some notion that you shouldn't be able to ship your garbage someplace else? That if if you, if you make garbage, you have to deal with it and have to some take some local control rather than be able to ship it across the state or ship to Dalton, trap to Pittsfield, and let them burn it up, and it just goes. It just magically goes away. They never have to see it again. How about, yeah, how about something that says you make trash, you have to deal with it, or it stays in your backyard. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. I mean, I think that would certainly put us all in the mindset of zero waste pretty fast. Well, so, it forces yeah. us to get, in, to get some local control over that well, as well, whether it's, you know, zero waste or some way, some way to locally reduce that waste to some, to some reasonable kind of through, through, you know, you know, compact, compacting it or incineration or, you know, or some other kind of, some other kind of pyrolysis or any of the other new technologies that are, that are being cleaner and give give some local control to these to these to these um, 
to these people who are producing all, all this crap. Yeah, absolutely. If, if I knew my trash, if I knew my all of my trash was going to sit in my backyard until I figure out what to do with it, you bet I would figure out what to do with it really quick, quickly, and not make any more. That's right. That's right. Um, so, uh, Timothy. Yes, uh, I, I guess we have uh, our our incinerator is going to close and it's going to go to a transfer station. Where is it going to be transferred to? Does anybody know? Exactly. Great question. Or Get, that gets back to David's comment. Anyone know uh, anything about that? I mean, I guess this is very new news. It seems like maybe yeah, this we happened don't yesterday. Yeah, it seems yesterday. like maybe we don't know this yet, but I think that's a great that that is exactly the questions to be asking of the of the city as this is being sorted out. Yeah. Um, let's see. I see Robert. Yeah, hi. Thank you for the presentation and the education. I, I'm gonna try to be succinct about this. It's, the question is for me. There are laws in the books and like for the, the law that requires the state to come up with a 10 year um, uh, plan. You said the 2030 plan was totally inadequate and you gave your, you had a slide on that. There are other laws I'm sure. Because, you know, because we can change things at the local level, at the household level, but we actually are a big complicated machine, the society. We need laws to regulate, to set the playing field. What would be like, what would be a really forwarding legal action apart from enforcing the existing bans right now? What would be like your favorite uh, legal action that could be, or law that could be created that would help us with this terrible problem? Yeah, well, I think a lot of the things that we would have wanted to see in uh, the in the zero waste plan. I mean, I gave a pretty bare bones outline <laughs> there, um, but I think a lot of those things could be done by the legislature. And in fact, some of them would have to be done by the legislature. So one bill that we're working on right now has to do with reducing packaging. And yeah. uh, it's about creating producer responsibility for packaging. And that is uh, that is a big that's one big piece. And I think a lot of the, like there's also, um, you know, single use plastic bans at the state level that are being considered, you know, by the legislature. Uh, one could ban all, you know, one could do a composting ban at the state level. So I think all of those, I think all of those things are, are, um, you know, there, there are options. Every, all those steps could be taken at, at the state level. So. Okay, so a quick follow-up question, if I may, really sure. simple. Um, are we working across states for more regional oomph? You know, like, like can, is there, are there any kind of cross-state efforts that you're aware of? It's a good question. I know that a lot of the organ, I mean, certainly our trash is often shipped across state lines, so. Um, no, I'm sorry, in terms of laws. Yeah, right, in terms of laws. Like, right. And like so packs and bans. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, there are some efforts at the federal level to get some of these laws passed as well. I mean, they could also be some of the, any of these laws could be done federally as well. That's always a even even more challenging lift than the state level often. But uh, there are some efforts in that direction. And certainly the organizations that are working on these issues are collaborating across states. So, um, okay, thank you. Yeah. I'll see. I'm going to say Ricardo, and then I'm going to go back to Chelsea for something in the chat, and then uh, Jim. So we'll go in that order. Good evening. Um, I'm Ricardo Morales. I'm, I'm the Commissioner of Public Services in the city of Pittsfield. So um, Welcome. I'm, glad I'm, you're here. I have a lot of, uh, I know there's a lot of questions around the uh, incinerator and in, in, in CEP and their bankruptcy and the sale uh so there's a i just wanted to say because i saw the questions can come up and i and i want to say that it is uh while the news wasn't really news in terms of the issues at the plant um we were not at all expecting that uh a sale would be happening with the intent to turn into a uh uh, transfer station. So right now we're essentially uh, gathering up our thoughts and looking at what are the next steps, what are the options, 
And we knew this would be happening eventually. So we have some legwork done on, on that, but it's, so questions like, where is our trash going? Uh, so a quick answer to that is probably, it's gonna go where a lot of other trash goes around the area, uh, uh, probably by some outfit like Casella or whoever the buyer is, uh, probably transported by Casella, no matter what. They're the, they're the largest outfit in the, in the area. So what, what the long-term answer, the answer for the long-term solution is, is essentially looking at the solutions for that you've been talking about, Elizabeth, uh, you know, the composting programs or pay as you throw implementing for, for the city, pay as you throw. Because, sure. you know, for, for the county, we generate approximately, I'm going to throw some numbers that I'm, think, I'm thinking they're accurate, but it's around 33% of the trash of the county, um, trash and recycling. Uh, I think Pittsfield has a little bit more on the share and recycling that, than on the trash. Um, but it's, it's, it's a lot, right? We're a city population of 44,000 people and, um, it's going to be a big change, but, um, in a sense, I'm going to say this, I'm, I'm also excited that it's going away because it's, it's also, uh, forcing change in to, towards the good side, you know, towards better. So, um, you know, we, we got to get there and, Right now, it seems like the citizens in Pittsfield won't have other uh, other options but to accept the the inevitable good thing. Um, so, yeah, looking at all, all the things that have been discussed here, we're working actively. You know, Jane has and, and, and our team has we have been communicating and and with others. So, uh, I'm sure you'll be listening or hearing from us uh, or in some way or form, I guess. So if there's any other questions, I'm happy to answer in terms of the uh, operations, uh, let, let them come my way. That's wonderful. I'm so glad that you're here and that you um, brought all of that up. And um, what, I guess what I would just, like as communities are in, you know, in, in this moment of transition, it's a real opportunity for the, the city. And I think one of the things that we, so we have this tension between, okay, we, we're producing a lot of trash now and we do have to put it somewhere. And also I think the question to keep asking is how do we find a solution that for the temporary problem that is not incentivizing us to keep producing trash for 30 years. So I'm, uh, one of the questions in the chat was about pyrolysis, which is a high heat technology. It's sort of considered a more modern incineration technology. Um, we actually, so Clean Water Action is opposed to pyrolysis and the development of building of pyrolysis plants because we think that, uh, what, what we've not just we think, what's been seen in, they've built quite a few of them in Europe. And what they're seeing where it's happening is that it is incentivizing trash uh, to be created because these, these, these facilities need large amounts of trash to keep running and they have to, and they can't operate if they don't have a lot. So then people are having to ship in trash from other places to keep these, these uh, incinerators running and it's a disincentive to create zero use, but zero waste rather, yeah. but they are still, they're still polluting problems with them. So, well, yeah. Well, one thing I wanted to add is that some some one of the things that um, we're hypothesizing uh, Pittsfield has been a little uh, on the uh, a little slow to pick up on recycling, uh, you know, and this might be a good opportunity for us in many ways, uh, not least of which is trash dealing with trash in Pittsfield for the past 30 years has yeah. been more um, or, or has been less expensive than dealing with recycling. Yeah. And so recycling has many other reasons for it be, you know, to, 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 to do recycling, right? As a community, we want to recycle despite it being more expensive uh, because of the transportation costs. Um, now there's one very enticing um, incentive for recycling that we didn't have before, and that is that it's going to cost less to recycle uh, because we will have to be uh, potentially right sending whatever is left over for trash in, in, in you know transporting it out. So th these are all things that 
the residents will now have to face. And, and, and it also impacts the surrounding communities as well uh, because of their use of the incinerator. Thank you for that. And I'll just say, uh, without making this a, just a back and forth, but Ricardo, if you wa want connection to any of the resources that Boston use, happy to, you know, that for thinking about their zero waste plan, happy to connect offline and talk about any of that. Um, let's see, I think I did, I pulled one question out of the chat, which, uh, so I'll go to Jim and then um, back to Chelsea for another chat question. <laughs> Timothy, or sorry, Jim. Uh, yep, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, good. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation and thanks to Beat for doing this, getting involved with the green drinks. But my question was on the uh, mattress recycling that the state is going to require or the disposal ban. Is there any kind of infrastructure that's, I don't know, that it's being developed to deal with the mattresses? Or are they going to be sent out of state? Or, I mean, I've just, no, I don't, I'm not familiar with the issue, but it sounds like it's maybe something that, uh, I don't know, somebody has to think about. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I do believe the DEP is thinking about that. I'm not in the midst of those conversations, so I'm not quite sure of the details. I do know just uh, that right now, if you buy a new mattress, that all, most companies will take away your old mattress uh, when you get the new one delivered. So that is sort of something that was already happening. And I believe that they do, uh, a lot of them do recycle it. And, you know, it can be, so, but a lot of the mattress material also goes along with the textile recycling because a good portion of a, of a mattress is the textiles and the foam. Uh, and then of course there's the wood and the springs inside as well. So good question. I don't know the details of how that's playing out but this is, this is pretty new that that's a ban. And so um, we'll find out more and I'll When I'll does that go into effect? Uh, I believe it's, the end, uh, let's see, my slide said it. Um, it said November, 2022. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> I knew it's it was later soon. this year. <laughs> yeah, in okay. a few months. Thank you. Yeah. Chelsea, were there a uh, question in the chat you wanna pull out? Um, one was, are any special efforts being undertaken to recycle more in hospitals and doctor's offices? Oh, that is a great question. There is so much waste out of hospitals. It's unbelievable. And I don't know, I know that when, I feel like, I don't even know exactly when the cutoff for this was, but there was a time when a lot more equipment was sterilized and reused that's all disposable now. So there is an organization called Healthcare Without Harm that does a lot of work on the environmental impact of hospitals. And I know that they've done some work around this. Um, uh, I think that's a real area for uh, improvement. Uh, so I don't have the answers to that, and but I do know that there are people that are thinking about that in some places, and it's a really good point that that's one of the problems. Yeah. Um, Timothy, I see your hand up, but I'm also going to go to see if there's any others in the chat from people that haven't asked questions yet, and then we'll come back if not. So anything else, Chelsea? Uh, there was a question about repurposing asphalt. Is asphalt repurposing considered a solid waste? Asphalt repurposing, is that considered solid waste? I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but is um, basically is if you take asphalt and turn it into something else or re, I don't know who, uh, I think it was Gail that asked that. Do you want to reiterate to come off mute and uh, explain your question? Is Gail still here? Um, well, I, I guess what I'll, what I'll say about asphalt is it's a very toxic substance. And so, you know, it's one of these things that the reuse does continue to have the, the, the toxic chemicals spread through other places. Uh, and there are, um, and so those kinds of things, it's really tricky. It's really tricky. Another example of that is old tires and th those get turned into uh, the, that crumb rubber that you might see on a playground surface. Like those are often made of old tires and like on the surface, of, on the face of it, you think, okay, 
uh, reusing tires is great. That's reuse, right? But then you've got this toxic material that children are playing on that's leaching into the soil around the playground. You know, so I think asphalt reuse is another similar issue where there's pros and there's cons and there's not a great, there's not a great answer. Um, so, um, you know, and that's all has to be sorted out by anybody that's trying to address solid, zero, just trying to move towards zero waste. Yeah. I see a, hand, see a hand up from Pamela, who I don't think has asked a question yet. Yeah, I did ask a question, but I asked it in the little chat thing. Okay. Um, it's really bothering me that we are um, pushing batteries so hard in our cars, in all, all kinds of ways. I mean, I don't, I haven't really sought out the whole process of batteries and my own contribution to it, but um, yeah. <clears throat> talk about yeah. recycle or reuse or pollution. That, this is a very serious thing, you know, and, and then we're, we're reusing metal for the cars that we're building, but that reused metal doesn't have the same longevity that, um, you know, an original metal is. So this brings me to how and who is addressing the source of the makers, you know, um, whoever. Yeah, is absolutely. The yeah. product. That's it. Yeah. Uh, um, it's a really good question. Um, a lot of the, the, as we move towards a, to address climate change and we're working to electrify everything, uh, there's a, you know, from cars to, Yep. home energy and all of that, batteries and other materials that we're using in addressing the climate crisis is a real conversation. And that's actually something we've been talking about, about clean water action, about how do we bring the work that we do around toxic chemicals and consumer products together with the work that we do around climate change. And that's a real serious issue that you raised. And so um, that really needs to be thought about. And I guess one of the ways that I just like to think about all of these problems that, you know, when you do one thing, you're trying, like, how do you not solve, cause them different problems? <laughs> the, the solution to what, you know, pro, how do you not cause problem B with the solution to problem A? And I think that we just really need to to know that, that is, those are not acceptable solutions. A lot of the time, those are the kinds of solutions that fall the heaviest on most heavily on environmental justice communities. And so we need to really be looking at everything that we're doing with a critical eye to this. And to if we have not come up with a solution that is both healthy for planet and people everywhere, then we have not yet come up with a solution and we need to keep working on that. So um, just it's a good frame to hold in mind. I see that we're at seven o'clock. I'm more than happy to keep answering questions, but I also don't know. I'm going to look to Chelsea about whether uh, you, how you want to handle the time and the remaining questions. Um, how about we answer the last two questions from Timothy and Peter, and then we can end. All right, that sounds great. Um, so Timothy, I think you had your hand up first, so go ahead. Okay. Um, let's see, a question and a comment. Uh, some, some products uh, uh, contain recycled uh, material uh, like um, uh, polyethylene terephthalate, the, 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 uh, in, in salad containers. Do you consider that a, a, a good use? Uh, uh, and, and also, I, I, I've, I've seen some and I've actually bought some uh, um, clothes that do have recycled content as far as uh, um recycle pet as well yeah yeah absolutely comment, sorry sorry go ahead sorry i thought you were oh i guess ahead. i guess the, i guess the comment was we can also demand more of our our producers uh hosta hill makes the sauerkraut but it has a plastic cap on it and there's right. a product right next to it it's got a metal one same stuff uh, right. The metals can rust. The plastic's going to stay around for thousands of years. So I went ahead and bitched at them, uh, email, and told them I'm going to buy your competitors until you change that. Right. So it's possible right. for us to make changes if we thank all start you. bitching. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so uh, what I will say about so yes, we this is another of our issues is uh, we do need to have more um, things made of recycled material. 
uh, and in all, all sorts. And there is in fact a project at the DEP now, there's like a, there's a work group working on ways to uh, kind of increase the, the market for things with made of recycled content. So that is something the Department of Environmental Protection is working on right now. I have not been in those meetings, so I don't know the details of what they're talking about, but that is um, an excellent point. And yes, that is part of what we need in a zero waste economy okay. is actual creation of goods from other uh, from other goods. The one thing I will say about um, that we we did not talk about microplastics tonight, and those are uh, you know tiny little fragments of plastic that get uh, are off a big problem. I mean, they're in a lot of our waterways. They're in the ocean. Uh, they're honestly falling down in rain. Um, they're probably in the soil, and that can be everything from just like a little piece of a straw that. Bro that's broken into bits to um, one of the things like polar fleet, uh, classic example, kind of horrible example of, of unintended consequences. Um, the company Polar Tech has been making, you know, fleece out of, and other companies too, but this is just the one that I know of that talks about it very publicly, has been making fleece out of um, recycled plastic bottles for years. And it's been realized more recently that every time you wash one of those bits of microplastic are coming off of it and going down into the sewer uh, or the, um, uh, sorry, the septic system. So, um, you know, again, we get, it's like just thinking about the full life cycle of all of these products is, is a very challenging thing, which is again, why we need to have sort of societal level solutions because any individual can't possibly track all of that or figure out all the solutions. Peter. Um, I don't have a question. I really have a couple of comments. Um, it, uh, it's The infrastructure issue is important. Um, clearly you're from the Eastern part of the state and many people who live where you do think that Massachusetts ends at Worcester and, and possibly Springfield. But we do have unique problems here being small sure. towns. And so when, when you talk about and you advocate for infrastructure systems, I hope you will reach out to people in this part of the state, especially people from Absolutely. small towns to see if, to make sure the infrastructure they're talking about really helps us. Part of the infrastructure um, uh, is the DEP grant program that they have. And um, one of the challenges that we've had over the years, and it's something that Susan Waite, who is the municipal assistance coordinator from DEP for Western Mass is aware of, is in the department's design of the grant programs, um, it has to look at the whole state, but overlooks the challenges faced by really small communities. Mm. So in order to get grants, municipalities have to generate points for doing certain things. But municipalities partnering on a swap shop, municipalities partnering on a repair cafe, um, don't work. Municipalities partnering on collecting mattresses. And um, our local committee had a meeting yesterday and we saw an article about an effort in Greenfield to gather um, packaging styrofoam, uh, large enough quantities to have a truck come from um, gold East Circuit recycling. Um, you can't do that with a single town in Western Massachusetts. Sure. And so in your advocacy work, if you could stress the fact that infrastructure has to work for everyone, not Absolutely. just the highly populated eastern part of the state, and be sensitive to that and encourage DEP to look at its grant programs so they're more helpful to small communities here, that would be a huge benefit to probably everybody who's on this call tonight. I really, really appreciate that comment. And I feel like what you just talked about is, it's an aspect of the conversation about environmental justice. And so whether every, you know, not necessarily every community that's a small town or a rural community is necessarily an environmental justice community, but a lot of similar issues come in to play about 
are we listening? You know, one of the things that we talk about when we talk about environmental justice is, are we listening to the people that are impacted? Are we listening to what's going on on the ground and not just what's, you know, going on in somebody's head at a, you know, in a state, you know, in an office building somewhere? And so I think that 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 really, you know, what you I just really what you just said is ex extremely important. And I will say that so I actually sit on the state solid waste advisory committee. So I am regularly in meetings, which is not particularly a powerful committee, but it is a place where I get to talk to people that are talking about um, these issues. And so I'm not in a decision making position for the state at all. But I am in a in a position where I can speak up about things. And so I will keep, I will make an extra effort to take that particular comment in mind uh, into those conversations. So thank you for that. So I think that's a great way to, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give Jane the last word there. <laughs> well, I just wanna say it, in response to Peter, Elizabeth is actually one of the people who really is great about advocating for small towns and I bug her a lot on that sort of thing. So uh, she's been on our side and I'm sure will continue to be. And I'm just so pleased to have had you out to do this without your having to drive all the way out here too. Well, thank you for that appreciation, Jane. And thank you to uh, Chelsea and Jane and everybody at BEAT for having me here tonight. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you all. And I um, will uh, again put my uh, email in the chat. So if anybody wants to follow up, feel free. Although I will say that I'm on vacation the rest of this week. So don't expect to hear back from me till next week. <laughs> I'm spending, I'm spending the rest of this week with a three and a half week old cousin. So <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here, Elizabeth. And thank you all for attending as well and all the great questions. Thank you. Thank you all.